Hello, beautiful lights, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. Today, we're going to be talking about human design astrology, and astrologer Janet Hickox is joining us, and Janet is an intuitive astrologer. She is a human design specialist, and that is a particular branch of astrology. She is also a TV and radio show host, and she has a blog talk radio show that is quite popular called Living Astrology. She has been cross-trained in several astrological modalities, Western astrology, Mayan astrology, and human design. And she calls human design astrology astrology for a new paradigm and if you want to check her out while you're listening to our show her website is living-astrology.com janet welcome hello tracy and thank you so much for having me on your show oh i'm just delighted that you could be here i found you in a kind of convoluted way with my guest zara ali who was talking about how our chakras and our astrology are linked and that got me curious about some of her other interests. Looked at her show and found you. You were kind enough to do my chart on that show. And I thought, I've got to have her on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're most welcome. This is like my favorite subject. So uh, I'm always pleased to be able to share it. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. I want to ask a general question at first. How did you develop your interest in astrology in general? What drew you to that and when did that happen? You know, it's kind of an interesting story and a very spiritual kind of story in that I think astrology was always with me. At least it was on the periphery of my awareness. It even started when I first met my husband. His mother immediately wanted to do my astrology. She was thrilled over the moon when she found out I was a Gemini, and she knew then that I was just perfect for her son. We eventually married. We've been married now 34 years, so she was right. Astrology (laughs) was right. (laughs) (laughs) It does tend to be because it's a science. (laughs) It, It is. It's actually an esoteric science. Absolutely. From that point, though, I went on, had children. So I got kind of interested in raising my family as opposed to doing anything much else. But somewhere around the time my son turned 10 years old, and this was probably in 2001 or 2002, he brought a book home to me. And you know how garage sale type things, they people put out boxes that uh-huh. say free take, you know? <laughs> so he picks his book out and he brings it home to me. And the book is astrology although I did not know that at the time. But I swear to you, that book traveled around my house for days until it finally got my notice when it showed up on my bed. And I had four kids, two dogs. I thought somebody was doing this to me, right? Putting the book (laughs) on the floor, putting it in my bedroom. I'd put it back on the bookshelf. It'd be back in my bedroom. And then one day I saw it on my bed and it was opened. And I went, okay, okay, I get it. Somebody wants me to look at this book. When I opened the book, it was an astrology book and it was based on a planet called Chiron, which at that point I'd never heard of. Yes. And Barbara Hanclow had written this beautiful book about this planet discovered in 1977. From there, it was almost like this watershed of revelation as I just sort of started remembering so much information. It was almost overwhelming. And of course, Mm -hmm. in those days, the internet was really just charging up. I mean, we've come a long way in the 15 years since the early 2000s. Yes. So I started looking up information and almost immediately started doing readings. It was almost as in there was this memory. I've done this before and it was there just under the surface. I just needed to open the doorway. You know, for the longest time, I was reluctant to share that. In fact, I wouldn't even charge to do readings for probably the first three or four years I did them because I couldn't quite get to the point where I wanted to tell people that I remembered this, because it's generally speaking, a subject that you would study. And that's not to say that I haven't studied it since or looked at red books and things like that. But the basics were already there. And I have no explanation except that I had done this in previous lifetimes, and it was just coming through. Yeah, I know that good astrologers such as you have that intuitive gift that goes along with it. Maybe a mathematician might see numbers with personalities and be able to remember sequences because it tells a story to them. Mm -hmm. I bet symbols do the same thing for you. 
for me, I look in astrological chart and I have to get out my index or something <laughs> to which planet is that again? <laughs> <You know? laughs> for me, it's almost like it starts revealing a story. The story is of you. When I relate that to people, I always capitalize the letters in Y-O-U because it's really a map a life map, perhaps we could say. And there's so much information that can be relayed through it that it can be so overwhelming. I used to call astrology my gateway, sort of a gateway <laughs> to being psychic, because yeah. I was reluctant again to tell people that I was psychic, that I was intuitive. Thanks. I didn't want people to laugh at me or to not believe me. So astrology actually gave me sort of the mechanical or physical representation of what my intuition was already telling me about somebody's life or direction and life path, etc. As I did more and more readings, I came to understand this was my gift. It's not so much anymore that I'm worried about telling people that I'm an astrologer. In fact, I almost am amused at their reactions. <laughs> right. I'm the same with this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ninety <laughs> percent of the people I think look at me and go, Oh, oh, you look up at the stars. You know, they think I'm an astronomer. Ah. <laughs> like, no, no. That's kind of the story of how I got to be doing astrology. Yeah, you know, from a medium's perspective. I look at the coordinates of our entry point of the birth, time, date, location, etc. as being kind of a portal. And I think of it as when you pass through that portal that we choose, it imbues us with the characteristics that are necessary for us to have the best possible outcome for our journey through the physical world. I think many of my listeners have probably had an astrological reading in a more Western traditional sense, and you do offer those as well. But I'm still curious, even after having my chart done, to know a little bit more about exactly what is human design astrology. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us first how you found it and then how that is different from Western astrology? Yeah. Oh, I would love to. Everything that happens in my life, it seems like there's always this magical thing that happens when a doorway is about to open for me. I happened to be preparing for a workshop that was going to go on, and I was doing a radio show ahead of that workshop, and there was another guest on the radio show who started talking about human design. And I said, well, what's human design? And he said, well, it's an astrology. And I went, you're kidding me. I'm an astrologer and I don't know about human design. So he quickly does my chart and starts telling me a few things. And of course, as any good Gemini would do, I had to look for more information. My curiosity got the best of me and I started looking into it more and more. And then a couple of months later, there was a woman that was also on the radio network that I was on. And we started chit-chatting and she said something about human design and that pricked my ears. <sighs> like, okay, this is the second time. And she connected me with Karen Parker See, she was Karen Curry at the time, and I started learning about it. It was unbelievable to me the gaps that human design filled in that I wasn't getting from my regular astrology chart. Now, you could say, of course, you know, your own chart's sometimes a blind spot for you and that kind of thing, but it was answering questions in a different way, and that's what I was really hooked on. This was giving me down-to-earth practical things that I could do to change my life in this moment. I was already calling my business Living Astrology, I mean, not because oh. uh, it was just some quirky name, but because I really felt like you're living this astro map that you have. Yes, that meshes with how I see it from my weird perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and if I can help you to learn how to live your life the way that your soul came here to live it, then you become more authentic and you become true to yourself. That was the thing that pushed me over the edge. I was like, oh my gosh, people have to know about this. I just like the way that you quantified the difference. Say it again for us about how human design helps you live your soul's journey. Tell me a just teensy bit more about that. First, let me back it up for just a second. So I want to give you sort of the mechanical, if you will, differences between Western astrology Excellent. and human yes. design astrology. So we can have a basis here. Human design astrology is really based in about four different esoteric sciences, as well as some new cutting edge sciences. And number one would be Jewish Kabbalah, the tree of life. When you look at your human design chart, you see it right there, right in front of you. 
also based on the Hindu chakra system. Mm. We call them energy centers in human design speak, but it really resembles the chakra system. Also, Western astrology components in here because we're using planets and we're looking at how those planets are lined up in your design. And then also the I Ching, in that there are 64 gates that we call the personality traits in the chart. And I know some of this is going to get a little confusing, so don't get bogged into that. I'm just kind of giving you this background no, on it. No, it's very interesting. And I Ching is a very complicated process. Yes. In one it way, is. it's very direct. I've taught it as just sort of a fun divination style for some of my students, but it was a little bit laborious and detailed. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can be, but all of this comes together in such a beautiful way. The two sciences that I see built up into this are quantum physics and also the human genome. Now, isn't it interesting that we have 64 pairs of codons in our human DNA and there are 64 hexagrams in the I Ching? To me, it's also coherent. There's a coherency to this. You know, I couldn't make up if I tried the quantum physics piece here is really interesting because we know from studies in quantum physics that we are energy and that our energy is always interacting with the other energies here on the planet, whether it's animal, whether it's your family, your friends, your community, but energy is always in motion and we're always intermingling. So what I really see in human design that I don't see in regular astrology is that energetic signature, the how is it that I interact with other people and how can I best interact in a relationship with other people to make it satisfying, to make it with ease as opposed to a dynamic where we're always in conflict. I love that part of this. I have not found, even in my in astrology, which by the way, I loved, I still love it. But I hadn't found a tool such as human design that gives me that down-to-earth, practical way to live my life according to what my soul's design was. What was mm -hmm. my soul interacting with as it prepared to be embodied on this planet? I can look at a human design chart. My own is a little bit foggy for me, so I get help from other friends uh -huh. to help me see those things. <laughs> a little help from our <laughs> friends. I think there's a song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I can tell you that it had immediate impact on my life when I recognized what my type was and how I had been not living my type. I had been living what I've been conditioned to be based on my culture, based on growing up in a family and in a society that values productivity and, and all these different things. So we're all conditioned into being something that may not be authentic to us or our truth. Would you be comfortable sharing the contrast? Oh, absolutely. I'd be curious. For example, one of the things that I had noticed in my life is that I was constantly, I don't want to say I was constantly quitting, but I was constantly faced with the feeling that this isn't working, so I'm going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And in mm. some cases, I did. For example, one day I decided I wasn't as successful as an astrologer as I was when I was working in the real world, you know, little quotes, real world. Mm. And so somehow I managed to decide that and quit being an astrologer and went back to work. Nothing against T-Mobile, the company I went to work for. They were awesome. But I felt like a square peg round hole. I would find myself out in my car every day at lunch crying because I just Aww. knew I'd gotten myself into the wrong thing. And the universe, bless its heart, was trying to tell me this right from the beginning. But I was just too stubborn and not listening and not noticing that they left my name off the list of interviews that day. And We do get conditioned yeah. to ignore what we feel. We're so cerebral or we're so desire driven that we forget to listen to that feeling part of ourselves what I had discovered in all of that is that as a generator, which is my type, I'm a generator, we grow on sort of a stair step path. So you're going uphill, let's say, and on the upswing, lots of action, lots of activity, lots of learning. And then you come to a standstill point. And that standstill point is meant for integration, only it can cause frustration in generators in my type, mm -hmm. and in about 35% of you out there listening are generators. Mm -hmm. And at that point where you get too frustrated, you can just choose to quit and go on when that should be your cue that the energy is about to shift and you're about to go back up on that uphill 
or learning part of your trajectory. So when I realized that, then I could look back over my life and go, oh my goodness, I've misread the signs. Now that I know that I'm on an integration path, I don't need to quit anything anymore. I just need to wait. One of the big things with generators is you learn that you're meant to respond to what shows up in your outer world. Now, how many times have you heard in your own life, Tracy, and the listeners, your lives as well, just go out and do it. Think of something and go do it. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, there's only 8% of the population that's designed to do it that way. The rest of us have other methods by which we enact our energy in the world. For generators and manifesting generators to some extent, which makes up about 70% of us, we are meant to respond to opportunities that show up in our outer world, not that come up in our heads. That's very interesting. Yeah, Yeah. especially since we're conditioned to act on a thinking process, a critical analysis of the options in front of you and act from that as opposed to what shows up in your outer world, in generators are sort of dancing with that outer world, right? We get to dance with the outer world. So when something shows up, like an opportunity, for example, to be on a radio show such as yours, Uh then I can decide yes or no. But I didn't go out looking for you. That would be the wrong way for me to entertain coming on a radio show. Now, you've mentioned generators slash manifestors. There's five types. Maybe give us a little snippet to understand in general their aspect. Okay, so first we have manifestors, and manifestors make up about 8% of the population. And they are really your getting the ball rolling kind of people. They start things, and they are not designed to finish things. I remember a manifestor that I did a reading with, and she just cried literally for five minutes in our reading. We had to pause and let her get through this information because she had been blamed all of her life from her family for starting things but never finishing them Mm. to the point where they didn't even want to listen to her new ideas of things that she was going to do. And my heart broke for her. As soon as I was able to open this up and say, look, that's who you are. That is what your design is. You are meant to get the ball rolling, pass it off to someone else because her life is experiential. And it's meant to be a starter, not a finisher. Yet, when manifestors find something that they really latch onto that's really important to them or that they're passionate about, they will take it from start to finish. Mm-hmm. But not mm-hmm. everything that shows up for them is meant to be started and finished. There's a huge opening there for those people who are out there whose parents or family members don't understand them because of that ability to start things, but to never finish things. And of course, that creates a great stress on the people that have that external expectation that they have to complete, 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 and then they lose the value of being exposed to different, 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 new, 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 start, start, start. Those things are good. I liken it to a mosaic for some people. They have the little pieces and then they feel like, well, I don't have a composite, but if you look at the whole picture, it's a beautiful Mm -hmm. just more intricately wrought. And if you're a manifester and you find yourself in an 8 to 5.30 kind of job, it's going to crush your spirit because Mm -hmm. that is not something that you can maintain for very long because they don't have access to sustainable life force energy. They're not designed to do that. They're meant to throw their hat in the ring, get something started, and then go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So that's who they're designed to be. Now we go on to the manifesting generators, and they're sort of a hybrid of the manifestors and the generators. And these are your multitaskers. About 32% of the population are manifesting generators. They are sort of worker bees. And as well as the generators, they are the people that have the energy, the sustainable life force energy to keep out their building. They're the builders. They're the trendsetters. They're the ones that actually can do the work and stay in for the long haul. Manifesting generators, they have huge amounts of energy. And so they do much better when they have multiple projects going. They multitask very well. They take shortcuts. They're not the ones that have to go A, B, C, D, E. They could do A and then maybe do C and then do F and then come back if they want to. They have their own way of doing things. Do I recall that you had found out that's what I that's suffer from in my, in my chart? <laughs> no, no suffering at all, but this is who you are. You it are is, a manifesting is, generator. Yes. 
manifesting generators are a wonder to behold because they could get so much done as long as what they are doing is something that they're passionate about. That's key to all of these types, by the way. You're not here to do mundane stuff, just everyday stuff, unless that's what makes you happy, Mm -hmm. right? That's Mm -hmm. the key is that all of us are here to do something. We all have a piece or a part to play in this grand experience that we call living on earth. If you can find that piece and live it wholly and fully and authentically, then that creates joy and happiness and peaceful relationships. It's amazing the effect that just knowing your design can have on how you react with other people in the world. Absolutely. Now, you said there are five types? Yes. So we've got the manifestors, the manifesting generators, and then the generators. And the difference with the generators from manifesting generators is that they are not multitaskers. They have a sort of passion. For me, I'm a generator. My passion is astrology. And that's the direction I move in. And I cannot skip steps. I have to take them one step at a time. And I notice that in myself when I'm learning something new is that I don't skip a step. I'll tell you a little story here real quickly. My son is a chef. The difference between him and I cooking is huge because he just throws in ingredients and it turns out beautifully. Me? Nope. I have to measure them. I have to measure them exactly because there's no way you're going to just catch me throwing in a handful of this and a a teaspoon of that. (laughs) I follow the recipe from step to step to step. That's how I'm designed. And now it may take generators a little longer to do things, but that's because we take that step by step progression to do things. And when you skip steps, you end up having to go back and repeat them because it just doesn't work. Now, the fourth type are called projectors. Now, projectors make up about 20 to 22 percent of the population. So they're one of the rarer types as well. Projectors are not here to work, that they often get labeled as lazy or no gooders or they'll never amount to anything because their whole energy level is about guiding, leading, managing people or projects. They're not here to do the actual work of the project. And further, they have to wait for invitations to enter into anything in life. They can't just like go out and say, hey, I'm going to do this. It just doesn't work for them. They will waste their energy and their time. They can end up sick or ill over the whole energy consumption that goes on when they're out there doing things against their type. They have to wait for invitations to come to them. But they do make good managers. They make wonderful managers because they're wise about people. They have an inner wisdom that they hold about what people work in what positions really well or how to motivate people because they're very sensitive to people and that energy that people have. And they're very creative and loving, generous people. But again, you have a type of person that cannot go out into the world and work 9 to 5 or 8 to 5.30, those daily grinds, because it will blow out their energy and burn them out faster than anything. The fifth type is very rare. They are called reflectors. Mm. And the reflectors make up less than 1% of the population. In fact, in the three years that I've been doing human design, I've come across two. They're exceedingly unique because in their human design, all of the energy centers are open and that means that they absorb all the energy around them and then they rebroadcast that energy out as if it's their own and it isn't a reflection. Number one, they have no real energy of their own. Oh, when you say centers are open, you mean that they are blank of a personal identity. Right. Oh, so they would be like the extreme empaths that can't perhaps separate their emotions from other people's emotions. Or they could be the opposite, too, possibly. They will take on the identity of the people around them. So it's very important that they surround themselves with people that have their best interest at heart. They're the ones that can often get themselves into big trouble if they get attracted to the wrong group. They can fall into that peer pressure to be and do things that are not authentic to them. But they're really beautiful in that when you have a reflector in your midst, you really have a way of seeing the relative health of the group of people or the dynamic that you're working with because they will reflect it. They're like an indicator. And in a way, that's kind of selfless. Yes. But I find they can get very depressed in their lives because they feel sort of aimless. 
In human design, as opposed to regular Western astrology, we don't use the signs like Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. Instead, we use types. And there are five types. The first type we talked about was the manifester. They are the initiators of things. They are not designed to start something and finish it unless it's something that they're truly passionate about. Then there are the manifesting generators, which are our multitaskers, the jugglers, if you will. They do best when they have multiple things going on in their lives and multiple streams of income even. They are designed as worker bees as well. And then there are the generators who have a lot of energy that they can funnel toward a passion of theirs. They're here to master something. And then we have projectors who are our leaders, our guides, our counselors. They're very wise about people. They don't have a lot of energy to do the day-to-day worker kind of stuff. So they're really here in a way to be the guides and the leaders, not to get involved in the actual day-to-day running of something. Then there are the reflectors where they absolutely have no energy that came of their own. So they're constantly the reflection of the energy in the environment that they find themselves in. And so it's very important for them to make sure that the people they're around and the environment that they're in is very supportive of them. Otherwise, they can find themselves in really horrid situations. These designations of type are coming from a human design chart. And in that chart, we have these nine energy centers, very similar to the setup of the chakras in the Hindu chakra system. Uh And it's these energy centers that determine what type you are in human design. So, for example, a manifester is a type that has not got access to the sacral center. So there's no energy in that center, yet there's a motor of sorts there's four motors in the energy centers and one of those motors is connected to their throat and that's what makes them a manifester. Mm. The manifesting generators and the generators, they're both that type because they do have access to that sustainable life force energy and it shows up in the body graph as a red sacral center. It's colored in red so you know this person has access to sustainable life force energy. The difference between the manifesting generator and the generator is that the manifesting generator again has one of those motors going straight to the throat which is the center for manifestation and speech and recognition and communication Mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's the distinguishment between the two of them. Now projectors and reflectors do not have any sacral energy. The reflector has no energy centers defined at all. There's no color on their chart. All the centers are just white. And the projectors have maybe one or two different centers, but definitely not the sacral center. You would actually have to get your human design chart to know what type you are. I was thinking how handy that would be if instead of doing psych evaluations for (laughs) employees that they just get the human design, HR institutes a policy of having the human design chart done and that helps them match the energies that are natural to that person to the best possible use within their corporation or the system. How would someone know their type? Well, the first thing that they would do is get a chart. That's very easy to do. You can go onto my own website and get your free copy of your human design chart. And that's Um, living-astrology.com. Right. And right up there at the top, it says request a free human design chart. I will send that to you as well as a description of what type you are. And I always throw in some other information, something that jumps out at me about your design, just to give you a little bit more information. I even have an app on my phone (laughs) that that I can enter in people's birth information and, and get their chart. It's fairly easy to find or it's getting easier to find. But the best thing to do is just to reach out and get that chart. That gives you your starting point. From there, you can get readings and so forth of your personal human design and take it deeper or as deep as you'd like to go. Is there anything that people should know about human design in particular? Like, I know it's a different way of approaching. I liked that you pointed out that it's by type, not by Mm -hmm. astrological sign. Yeah. And you know, what's really kind of fun about it is that each type has a strategy. And that strategy is how that type can best work with their energy to become successful in their life. Because as my teacher always says, we are not designed to suffer. There is no gate of suffering in the human design chart. So humanity, when it's suffering, is not living their design. 
I mean, that's kind mm-hmm. of the bigger picture of it. And there may be many reasons behind that. Most often, it's because we've been conditioned to behave in a certain way. And if that's not in authenticity with your type, then you're constantly beating your head up against a wall. Yeah. We've all been there where you keep trying and you keep trying and nothing's working until either you got disappointment, you get bitter, you are frustrated or angry. And that's what strategy is all about in human design is to keep you from having to live out those kinds of energies. So the theme that comes along with each of the types is that what the negative would be. For example, for generators and manifesting generators, it's frustration doing things and they don't work out and why aren't they working out and dang it I thought this was it and it's not not getting there fast enough (laughs) yes your case not getting there fast enough in my case it's like what the heck I'm quitting I'm out of (laughs) here so I mean if you know this energy I mean if you know this about yourself then when these things happen in your life like I've had a recent bout of frustration I could easily have done the same thing that I did a few years back, quit what I'm doing and go on and do something else. But I recognized that I'm in an integration period. It saved my hide. I mean, I don't have to be frustrated. I don't have to think I've done something wrong. I don't have to think that the universe is out to dump on me. It's not that at all. It's almost a forced period of time for me to learn and grow from all the things that had been happening over the previous time period. Take a breath, assimilate. Exactly. And get perspective. And that's why I would urge everybody to at least get their human design chart. Just to know what you are so you understand why you are. (laughs) You know, almost every person out there listening will tell me when they get a reading that they're frustrated because of this, or this is always happening to me, or I can never seem to get where I want to go. And that's almost always reflected in their human design chart, because they're trying to do things counter to what would be successful for them. What a relief to discover that it is your design and that it's natural to be the way that you are. Yeah, absolutely. And do you know what else is a byproduct of all of this that I discovered quite accidentally almost is that as I learned to understand myself and live my authentic life, the less judgment I had on those people closest to me when they didn't do things the way I wanted them to do them. (laughs) Oh, you know, that makes sense because you would understand it's in their nature. That's how they are. And each of the types has positives and has negative. We're all human and all divine. (laughs) And it's beautiful in that just with type, my life changed hugely Mm. in that I recognized what I had been doing wrong from the standpoint of how my energy works and how I needed to enter into things in my life. For example, I would always say yes to everything. And I think there's probably a lot of people out there, particularly women who are doing that very same thing. Just to make it worse for me or to make it more obvious, you know how the universe can be like so in your face. I even had a girlfriend who said she only wanted friends who said yes to everything. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) How exhausting for her friends. (laughs) Well, exactly. But she's my friend. So I definitely anytime she wants to do something or wants me to get involved in something, I need to say yes. But is that true for me? What I had to eventually discover is no, that is not true for me. There's a time and a place to say yes, yes, and a way to enter into things, but not just because somebody says something. In everybody's design, there is also an authority And the authority I look at as sort of my decision making tool that I can kind of pull out when I don't know for sure what the answer is. Am I to do this or not to do this? There are different types of authority. Mine happens to be emotional. And emotional authority is meant to not be spontaneous. So I cannot say yes off the cuff because that's not right for me. That has to wait until your emotional wave is complete. Because emotions, they have an energy to them that sort of flows. They have highs and there's lows to our emotions. If you're making decisions from this place where you're all giddy and happy and on high, then you may be getting yourself into things 
that once the low part of your wave comes up and now you're like, oh my God, what did I say? <laughs> and this is me. I would get myself into these things and later I'd be like, how do I get myself out of this? Yes. So then I'm faced with either looking like a flake by backing out of things all the time or forcing myself into something, which of course doesn't work for everybody at all. It's an interesting tool to have your type and knowing the type, you know, your strategy, but then also getting your authority and knowing where is it I make decisions from. Some people make decisions from their intuition. It's that voice uh -huh. inside that says, turn left, uh -huh. <laughs> do this. Other people have authority in the sacral chakra that says a very deep down body, yes or no. I think one of the lessons I learned big time from human design is to get out of my head and down mm -hmm. into my body that the body hosts way more wisdom than my head does. Yes. Interestingly enough, there is not a person on the earth designed to make decisions from their head. No one has authority in their head center. Is not that even in their interesting? Head. So put the mind aside or the mental, down into mental your body. part aside. Yeah, get out of the head and into your body. After all, you are a human being in a physical manifestation on a physical planet. Get into your body. Your body is the interface for you between your spirit and the earth. Yes. And it makes perfect sense when you look at it from that place instead of always being in your head. You had done my chart. And before we shift into our final topic, I thought, was there anything that stood out to you or that you'd like to share Oh, yeah. For example, one of the first things that jumped out at me about you before I even really met you that day, I got your birth information, got your chart, and I went, oh, now I get why she's a medium, because I can see psychic ability or intuition in your chart. It's very strong, and it's also connected to your soul via gate 10, which connects up quite nicely with your psychic channel, if you will. That tells me that you're meant to, from your soul, share information that comes up from that space. It's how you empower others. And the fact that you are a medium means that somewhere along the line, you connected with your true self. Now, that doesn't mean you yeah. went to being a psychic right away or being a medium right away, but you've managed to get in alignment with your true self. It's interesting. Thank you for that interpretation. I know during my life, I've always had these gifts and exemplified them through friendships and in a church setting in my 20s, etc. But when I decided to step away from being a real estate broker and go full time into consulting, I just feel like I have found my purpose. I really do feel that way. And it's fascinating to me that that would be visible. It is very chart. visible in your chart. Every person has a profile. When you get your human design chart, you're going to see some information, type, profile, and authority. Your profile, it's a very visible profile in that you are meant to work with groups of people, and you are also a role model. So that particular designation, the 4-6, the opportunistic role model, funny terminology, I know, mm -hmm. but you are really destined to be out there working with people. And to do that appropriately, of course, means that you have to share something with them, your gifts, your talents. And it just so happens that lines up then with your being an intuitive or a psychic, whichever terms you want to use here. I do love teaching. I really do. I like to see it come alive for other people. Too. You know, and that's another great word to use. Thank you for saying that, because no matter what, the energy of manifesting generators and generators often falls to or the role models that are manifesting generators or generators, often falls to education in some way. It's more than you just passing on a message from a, a loved one. It's really a process of enlightening. It's giving them that perspective. And you, through your work as an astrologer, have a very highly unique perspective of things. How would you say that it's changed your view of life, maybe? to do what you do. I have this saying. It's not my saying, but as I heard this saying, I knew that it had meaning for me. And that was, know thyself. 
just those two words is the key for humanity to know yourself. And then I would say, and to thine own self be true, should follow that. Because if you're not being true to yourself, then you're not doing anybody any good. And we have this thing, I don't know where it started about being self-centered, being identified with being selfish, or in some way being vain, or narcissistic, or whatever. I mean, I'm sure people can take it to that degree in that level. Mm. But you need to come first in your own life. And that starts when you know yourself. And astrology is a tool to help you know yourself, the true, authentic you. What I find really interesting is there has not been one person yet that as soon as I start talking to them about their design, they recognize it. And they almost can tell me to the minute where they stopped being true to themselves. And that happens through school, through parents or college or pressures in the world that kind of got them off track. I think we come to the planet knowing our design, but we forget it through conditioning, through just being in a very dense sort of atmosphere on a planet that is very physical in nature. And finding out who you are is the best service that you can do for yourself and for others. Because then you are able to give because you know who you are. And that's where we begin to speak from our center, to speak from our authentic voice, to not be disturbed by the behaviors of other people other than how we choose to manage our response to that. Being able to step back and to feel that sense of satisfaction in the completion of our happiness through our choices and the things that we do. Now, one thing that's different with human design versus regular astrology is that I get a picture of what your personality traits are from your personality level or your conscious level. But we also get to look at your soul level or the unconscious you. Because not only do I have and you have and everybody else have a planet, let's just say the sun, sitting in a gate or a personality trait that's in the physical personality part of me. But I also have something from a soul level that I can see, that I can connect with and get a fuller picture of what I am here and what I'm doing here. That's priceless to me. You cannot put a price tag on that. No, that's the perspective that each of us seeks. And when we find it gives us satisfaction. Janet, I want to thank you so much for joining me on our show from a medium's perspective and getting a little glimpse of life from an astrologer's perspective. (laughs) (laughs) Thank Thank you, you Tracy. Um, If you want to reach Janet, her website is living-astrology.com. If you'd like to listen to past episodes of our show, you can find them at mediumtracylockwood.com. Next week, we have an author Alea Dow, who is going to talk to us about the concepts contained in her inspired book, Seven Cups of Consciousness. So I just want to welcome you back next week and leave you with this blessing. May today there be peace within. May you trust that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith in yourself and in others, and the source of our light and love. May you use the gifts that you have received and pass on the love that's been given to you. May you be content with yourself just the way you are. Happiness is there for each and every one of us. Go in peace. We'll see you next week for another view of life from a medium's perspective. And remember, it is never inappropriate to be kind. And without integrity, we have nothing. 